Ephesians chapter 4. Would you lead us in prayer, please? Sure. Please pray with me. Most precious and heavenly Father, we thank you so much for another opportunity to assemble together, Lord, to study a portion of your word. Father, we pray that you give us a knowledge and understanding and help us retain so we could be light to this world, Lord. Please pray with all those who are traveling this way, Lord, that they may come here safe. And we pray all this in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. All right, Ephesians chapter 4, let's jump right in, verses 1 through 6. Who will read that for us? Ephesians 4, 1 through 6. Wrong. I, therefore the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you to walk worthy of the calling with which you were called, with all lowliness and gentleness, with long suffering, bearing with one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called in one hope of your calling. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all, and through all, and in you all. Okay. Remember back in chapter 3, he talked a lot about uh, how it was his role, his job, it, it was grace that was given to him, to be a participant in revealing the gospel, teaching the gospel, and in part he laid out how that it would be the Jew and Gentile together, things such as that. And now he's jumping into, here's the application. Since that is the case, then here is something that I am pleading with you about in the New King James. It says, I beseech you to walk worthy of the calling. So he being a prisoner of the Lord, being one who is in prison because of his commitment to the Lord, his devotion to him, his service to him. He's appealing to them to take these things on board, if you will. Um, so when you think about calling, what worthy of the calling with which you were called, what is that calling? The gospel message. Okay, the gospel message comes to you. And any other thing you want to add to that? The gospel calls to us and we participate in that and that's our calling, Ron? Well, isn't it calling us even into the system of belief and the faith and all that is provided to direct us in our lives and how we behave, conduct ourselves, the things we think where we set our affections. Right, right, exactly right. It, into that system of faith. That's, that's where we've been drawn to. And that's the thing to which we have committed ourselves. So question number one I'd ask, how may we walk worthy of the calling with which we were called? You use that calling to govern your daily conduct. So all your actions throughout the day, I guess into the night, are governed by, by that gospel calling in Christ. Okay. Anything in addition to actions? Because that's well, your thoughts, one of the things I exactly had. What's that? Your, your thoughts, and your, your, your heart and your mind are for what Christ is after. But if, if that's right, then your actions are going to be correct as well. Right. And the way I kind of summed up two categories of what he's listed here, your attitude and your actions, that those two things need to be correct if you're going to be walking worthy of the calling. So with some of the attitude there, what does he say in verse 2? What does he have? Some of the specifics. In lowliness and gentleness, long-suffering, bearing one another in love. Okay, so lowliness. What is lowliness? Being humble and treating others 
better than yourself. Okay. Like Philippians chapter 2. Okay. The, the lowliness really points to humility in your life. You have the proper estimation of yourself. You're, you're not proud. You're not arrogant. Things like that. What about the gentleness? And you may actually have a different word translated in your version. Meekness. Yeah. Meekness. And what is meekness? It is not self -assuredness. Okay. The, I, I have a, uh, a power and I'll just do whatever I want. Meekness is the power under control. You, you, you may have the power to exercise. And meekness, lowliness has to do a lot with our fellow man. Meekness primarily is our relationship to God, that we bring ourselves under His control, and of course that affects our actions toward others. What about the long-suffering? What's another word for that? Patience. Okay. Who does he say to be long-suffering with? Or with whom does he say to be long-suffering? For you sticklers. What's that? He's giving everybody a chance. And long-suffering is he deals with us a long time. That's long-suffering. Okay. And who is Paul telling us to be long-suffering with? One another. Let's be very specific. That is exactly right. What's that? Christians. Why do we need to be long-suffering with Christians? Why does he have to admonish us? Because we can offend each other and sometimes not even know that I, I've offended you. Um, and we need nope. to let each other know, hey, Stephen, that, that offends me, what you said. And, and as long as it's I'm not sinning, if you offend me on something that's not a uh, <laughs> spiritual matter, then that's wrong. And, you know, same thing that I do to you as well. Okay, got several hands going up. I'm going to go in order, which I saw Mike, John, then Nancy. And, and I think it has a lot to do with we're all kind of under construction ourselves, you know, that we come out of different backgrounds, um, different sins that I have to overcome that maybe you don't anger issues that maybe I have to overcome you know so I mean, there's a lot of I, I think there's a reason that he said be patient with one another so John I think that's right that we all have sins chapter one pointed out we were all we have all been in sin at one time and we realize that that something needs to be done about that well just the fact that we all started from the same place you know consider that other brother that you know they we, we were at that point one time when we were in sin and we needed help. Well, be patient with that brother. Be long-suffering towards that brother because we were there one time as well. And we were in need of Christ's uh, love and salvation too. Well, in, in another aspect of that, we all grow at a different rate. It may not be sin. It may just be that we don't fully understand some obligation or some requirement that we should be developing in ourselves. So we have to be patient. Growth takes time. It may not be sin that you're committing, it's just that you haven't grown to that understanding yet. And once we reach a point of understanding, it, we have to be patient. But look how long it took me to get this. I mean, I, I, I often think when I'm discouraged by uh, uh, that kind of thing, I think, well, how long did God say, I wish Nancy would have gotten this sooner? Sure. And that helps you to understand that everybody grows differently. We they do. grow the same, but they grow at different rates. Right, right. And I, maybe this is oversimplifying it. He's admonishing it because we need it. We, we are people, and we have differences and different personalities, different judgments on things. And there's times when there's going to be some friction. There's going to be disagreement. There's going to be times, well, why don't they get this type of thing? And kind of back to the point uh, Hank was making, 
There are things we just have to let go. If it's not doctrinal, it you know, there are some things when it's a personal thing that maybe we need to address, especially if there's like a habitual problem again and again that we need to address like, hey, you know, this is an issue, we need to talk about it. I, you may not realize it, it bothers me, it, it does this, whatever it may be. But there are other things we just need to let go. Be long suffering. You know, sometimes people say things they're not really thinking when they say it. And you just say, okay, I'll let that go. I know they don't mean anything bad or harmful or hurtful or anything like that. So some things we just need to let go. Long suffering, he says, we need to have this bearing with one another in love. Thinking about what's in the best interest of each other. How, how can we help each other to serve the Lord and to grow and to keep going instead of having that animosity and going at each other and discouraging one another? Yeah, brother, if that passes, I'm not going to remember where it goes, but um, it's good to especially go to the house of faith. Would that be something parallel to this passage? Well, it would, it would fit within it, doing good to the household of faith in Galatians 6 there. Okay, thank you. Yes. Even if, when you consider, he's, he's talking about to the Jews and the Gentiles here, there, these two races, if you will, needed to work together as one in the Lord's church. Well, it applies to us too, with those differences that we have. Right, right. And they, I mean, you, you read the book of Galatians, um, you read the book of Hebrews, and see how there was a real difficulty in fitting these two cultures, these two religious backgrounds together in one. But we know that it can be done. So then he goes on to talk about actions that we take, endeavoring, I see that as an action, endeavoring in what? Keep the unity of the Spirit. Okay, first of all, unity of the Spirit. What would that be? He defines it in 4 through 6. Okay, well, you summarize it for us. There's a series of ones. And so, if, if there's a bunch of ones, then is Christ divided? You know, that type of... Okay, and when he references the Spirit, what's he pointing toward? Unity of the Spirit. He's not talking about attitude here. He's talking about something else. Would he be referencing the, the truth the, yes. that the Holy Spirit has revealed it to us in God's Word, and that's where we're going to find out how to handle these situations in that one, in that one truth. Right. He's saying you, you be united in truth. And then as Clint said, he reveals seven of these things as he goes on. He gives some specifics. But he's saying be united in the truth. So endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. The idea of that brotherly love that you strive to live peaceably with one another. And there are times where those things can be challenged and they can be strained. But we need to be committed to that. And as he says here, we can do this. Otherwise, it wouldn't be commanded. And we can get through things that are difficult for us as a group, as a congregation of God's people. Any other thoughts there, Mike? Well, you know, as we pointed out, it says be diligent. That is something that you, it, it is a priority for this. And it also calls it a bond of peace. In other words, you know, we're, we're, we're part of one. Mm -hmm. So we're bonded together. I mean, and, and we can't be separated. Um, you know, some of the problems that they had in Corinthians, you know, as um, Clint pointed out, is Christ divided. Mm -hmm. Did this person died for you? Did this person died for you? I didn't die for you. you know? So, you know, they obviously were not, did not make it, they were not diligent in their quest for this, or their endeavor for this. Exactly. And thinking about that bond of peace, huh? if, if peace isn't there, we won't be bound together. We'll, we'll break those bonds. And it takes work, just like any relationship, your marriage relationship, your family. It takes work to keep that family healthy, those relationships healthy. If you just let it go, you neglect it, then it's going to wear down. It's going to tear down over time. So we have to endeavor. We have to work at it. 
uh, and not give the devil an opening, an opportunity to come in and destroy that unity, that peace that exists. All right, verse... Take yeah, I'm just thinking about um, Jesus when he spoke about the kingdom divided by itself cannot stand. And yes. Divided by, by itself cannot stand. Right. Exactly. We can't stand if we are divided. So question number two, I asked you to list the seven ones and cite two scriptures that support each one. So we'll grab uh, some of these real quick here. Um, so, body. There is one body. What's that talking about? Where else does it affirm this? The church. Okay, it's the church as defined in chapter one, right? Where else does it talk about one body? Romans 12.5. Okay. One body in Christ, right? Yeah. yeah, exactly right. How about spirit? One spirit. What's that saying? Ephesians 3.5. Okay, Ephesians 3.5. And what does he mean by one spirit? So there's one body, there's one church, there's only one universal group that belongs to God. There is no other. There's only one spirit. What does that mean? Who is the spirit? What is his role? Reveals the word. There's only one that reveals it. Yeah, there's only one revelator of truth, and that is the Spirit, the Holy Spirit. All right, one hope. What is that one hope? Live with. Live with. Uh, God. What, what's that? <clears throat> to go, go to heaven. Okay, yeah, to go to heaven. Resurrection from the dead to eternal life. Is that one hope? Where else does the New Testament talk about it? It's in the definition of faith in Hebrews 11, one for the things hoped for. Yeah. All right, one Lord. Um, whenever he says that one hope of your calling, for which you're calling, you know, I think he's referencing back up to verse 1 about walking in that calling as if you do have hope after this life is over but there's something else out there that's far greater than what you have here now right so here here's something i'm backing up to the one hope and i'm glad you did because did you know not all very loosely using this christians believe in one hope uh, Jehovah's Witnesses believe in two. They believe one hope for 144,000 that will be in heaven around the throne of God, and another hope is all the rest of them live on earth forever. So there's, there's two hopes there. This is one of those passages where you can look at it and say, look, there's one hope. There's not two. There's only one. All right, one Lord. What's that talking about? So you've got one spirit, you've got one Lord, and then in verse 6, you've got what? One God and Father of all. Okay, so when it says one Lord, what specifically is in mind here? One Jesus Christ. One Jesus Christ. One Savior. One Savior. There's only one Savior. All right? Muhammad, Buddha, whoever else people might try to put before us as Lord and Master, as the one to follow, as the one to listen to? No, there's one. One Lord, Jesus Christ, and it's in Him that we find salvation. One faith, what is that? The gospel. The gospel. It's not one belief. This is not the context of it. It's Everything in here is objective. This is not subjective. This is an objective faith, the faith, one gospel, once for all revealed, like a great many of the priests in Acts 6-7 were obedient to the faith, speaking of the gospel. All right, one baptism. What about that? It's only one type. You're not going to sprinkle anything, just submersion. Okay. A lot of people believe in two different types, one sprinkling and the other one fully submerged. Okay, that's one application. 
It's only immersion. It's not sprinkling, pouring, and immersion. There's not three different forms. What else? It's not, it's not the baptism of John. It's not Moses' baptism from the Old Testament. It's not the Holy Spirit baptism. It's baptism for the remission of your sins in the blood of Christ. Yes. Okay, that's a big one because there's a lot of people today that believe in baptism of the Holy Spirit and water baptism. Here it says there's one baptism. I guess I should do one instead of... <laughs> there's one baptism, right? That's it. And Ron? In 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 21, where he's talking about the antitype, you know, of this baptism which now saves us, you know, not putting away the filth of the flesh, but an answer for good conscience towards God. You know, there was only one flood. Right. There's only one baptism. One ark. One ark. That's right. right. One place of safety for those individuals. Right. Right, exactly right. Mike, do you have some? Well, I mean, just to piggyback on what those guys have just said, there's only one reason for baptism, and that is for the remission of your sins. Mm -hmm. And inside of that, all these other things that God operates in, He causes all those other things. How this happens, I don't know. I just know that you have to be baptized for the remission of your sins. That's what we're calling. Right, exactly right. Clint? Uh, Romans 6, 3. For do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus, the one Lord, were baptized the one baptism into his death, the one death? Mm -hmm. We only had to die once. Right. We only need to be baptized once to be saved. And, we only had one saved. And the Hebrew writer goes to great extent explaining one death, one sacrifice was sufficient in the pure, perfect Son of God versus all the animal sacrifices down through the centuries that did not take away sins. Um, yeah, exactly right. So there, there are people who want to add things in that are not in the Word of God, and here is a beautiful passage put very succinctly. There is just one of each of these things wrapping it up with one God and Father. There's only one Creator. There's one Father uh, to whom we give an account in the end. So you have all these ones here. Any other thoughts on those seven great ones? Um, there in verse 6 when it says that God the Father of all who is over all and through all and in all do you believe that's all Christians or all mankind? Uh, in this context, I would say all Christians, but the broader context, he's over all. And it, it may even be a dual application, one of God and Father of all. Well, here, here's the thing. When Galatians chapter 4, I think it is, and also Romans... Eight says the spirit by whom we call Abba Father that those who are children of God we're the only ones who rightfully can call God our Father everyone else can call him God because that that is the relationship but until they come into the family of God they can't call him Father so that's why I would narrow it down to Christians at in this particular passage but well, the reason I ask that is because verse 7 says, but to each one of us, grace was given. So, if he's talking about the all, I guess, as being everyone, all of mankind, we have to understand that there is some of the Father in each, each and every person. We have to keep that in mind. But to us, uh, grace was given according to the nature of Christ's gift. Um, it's neither here nor there, but I'm just... Well, everyone's certainly created in the image of God, and we need to look at them in that way that they really truly belong to Him, just the relationship is broken. They need to come back to Him. All right, anything else down through verse 6? Ron? Just a thought on, on what God over in Galatians, you were mentioning Galatians 4, but over in Galatians 3 and verse 20, after it describes you know, Christ being our mediator, He says, Now a mediator does not mediate for one only, but God is one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he's on one side of that, and he is one God. Uh, Old Testament <coughs> speaks of the, the Father in one nature of divine being there as well. 
All right, let's read verses 7 through 16. 7 through 16 as we see the body being equipped with what it needs for unity. Ephesians 4, 7. Tell you what, this is a little bit longer, so we'll break it up. 7 through 11 and 12 through 16. Who will get that for us? Clint. But to each one of us grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore, he says, when he ascended on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts to men. Now this, he ascended. What does it mean but that he also first descended into the lower parts of the earth? He who descended is also the one who ascended far above the heavens, that he might fill all things. And he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers. And 12 to 16, who will grab that? Go ahead, Micah. For the equipping of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of us, so we all come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro, carried about for the, ever, for the every man of doctrine, by the trickery, deceitful, by the trickery of men and the cunning craftiness of deceitful thoughts. But speaking the truth in love may grow up in all things into him who is the head of Christ, from whom the whole body is joined and knit together by what every joint supplies according to the effective work by which every part does its share causes growth in the body for the edifying of itself in love. Okay. So First thing he talks about is to each one of us, to all Christians, there is a grace that is given according to the measure of Christ's gift. And really what that's talking about is according to his standard, according to his will, according to his way. Um, it talks about Jesus leaving heaven and coming to earth and going back to heaven. When it talks about to the lower parts of the earth, uh, some want to be very specific about that he went into a grave and he came out of that grave. While that's true, this is looking at a bigger, broader context, like in Philippians chapter 2, where it talks about how he humbled himself and he made himself a bondservant. And he lived here as a man and then he ascended back into heaven. He was exalted again. That's really the idea that he's putting out here. But when it talks about according to the measure of Christ's gift, uh, is talking about, it, in the original, there are two words essentially that we translate gift. One of them is charisma, the other one is domata. Charisma, sometimes in the context, is referring to a spiritual gift. This is not that word, this is a different word. This is domata, which means sort of a generic term for gift, but it's really the idea of a gift of love is what God has given here. And he's talking about to each one of us. He's talking about to all those who are in the body of Christ. It's a gift that all of us enjoy. And his ascension back to heaven was essential for that to happen. Do you remember when Jesus told his disciples that he had to go to his Father because if he didn't, he couldn't send the Spirit? He said, I need to go to my Father and I'll send you the Holy Spirit. It's kind of that same idea being presented here. So question number three, I had asked, considering those listed in verse 11, what's the primary way a church and saints are built up? Uh, it gives a list of, of roles, and it's those who are leading and teaching the gospel, the teaching the word. So... Uh, Talking about apostles, you know that we can't have those anymore, but we have evangelists, pastors, and teachers. Um, how if if we all receive this, and we know in the first century, of course, they have an apostle writing to them, but how are the apostles and prophets a gift to us? Through the written word. Right. Through the written word, we have the results of their labors. 
So in that way, they are a gift to us, the apostles and prophets, the revelation, the confirmation of the word, a continuing blessing upon the people of God. Evangelists, pastors, teachers. Steve. Sure. Going back to your question about how are they a gift to us, if you go to 2 Thessalonians 2.15, it says, Therefore, brethren, stand fast and hold their traditions, which you were taught, whether by word or our epistle. Now, this is Paul writing to the Thessalonians here, so he, sometimes we stray away from that word tradition, but the apostles set forth a tradition that is a gift to us because they laid the groundwork for the gospel. It's a divinely revealed practice yeah. that we are to continue, and in that sense, that's how he's using that word traditions, because, of course, Jesus talked and taught against the traditions of men, the doctrines and traditions, commandments of men. So yes, exactly right. So we have that that's been revealed and laid down, and that is to be our ongoing pattern to follow after Rome. See, we're proving lessons about Christ being the great physician, and that physician has written a prescription. Mm -hmm. If you will, the apostles are administers. They're administering to us through the word the things that give us life. So they administered the word. Right. Formula hasn't changed in 2,000 years, no. right? Same, same exact medicine. Paul? Uh, 1 Corinthians 12, verse 7, that the manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one for the profit of all. Okay, over in 1 Corinthians 12, that's talking about the spiritual gifts that they had. Here's different with the different individuals or functions within the body of Christ that God has given. And he's talking about these as a class of people, not as individual people. So he gave the apostles and prophets, it benefits the entire body. Then he goes on to talk about evangelists, evangelists working among the people of Christ, doing the teaching of the word of God, calling on men to submit to him and do his wills. Pastors, so you've got elders that have been given to the church. He says, here is how you organize yourself. Here is how you have leaders in a local congregation. You have pastors. And part of their duty is making sure the flock is fed. Part of their duty is making sure that those who stray away are to be disciplined in one way or another, taught to come back, or if they refuse or won't come back, they need to be disciplined. They need to be withdrawn from. So they've got that duty and responsibility. Uh, teachers, of course, teaching, various teachers in the body of Christ. Uh, the older women teaching the younger women would be one of those that would fit in that category. So he, the whole thing that he's laying out here is that the way the body is unified and the way to growth is through the teaching, the study of the Word of God. There is no other way. So what does that tell us? What, where, where should we put an emphasis as the people of God? Scripture, the Word. Scripture, the Word. How do we do that? Well, let me ask you this. Technically, technically, could we meet for 10 or 15 minutes on Sunday, that's it, and fulfill what God has said for us to do? No. I'm sorry? No. I disagree with you. <laughs> he says meet on the first day of the week. We need to study from his word. We can do that in three minutes. Three minutes. I could just read a passage and say, hey, everybody, don't lie this week. We've studied. We could partake of the Lord's Supper, maybe five minutes. We could pray, we could sing a song, we could give and be gone. We could technically just, boom, let's just run through it, check all the boxes, and out we go. Is that going to make for a healthy, unified body of Christ? That's why there's the wisdom and the general practice, and it, it varies from place to place, but that's why we come together for classes. 
That's why being here is so important. Because we're not going to grow as a people if we are not studying. And we need to study, we need to study individually, of course. But we're talking about as a body of people. We need to be on the same page. We need to be studying together. And so the importance of being at services and studying and being prepared for those studies and participating in the studies and being engaged as we study together. I think I saw a couple of hands, Clint, then Ron, then Mike. So in Acts 20, Paul's talking to the Ephesian elders. <laughs> In verse 32, this is kind of coinciding with your question here about the saints are being built up. So now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and give you an inheritance among all those who are sanctified. So it defines what's able to build you up. And so the teachers, the evangelists, they're telling jokes, they're, they're sharing stories. They're, that's not building anybody up. That's an entertainment value, right? So you already made it. I'm just trying to emphasize it again. Is the only way we're going to be built up is through the Word. And there's no other way. But also, you know, if we're in and out, you know, if we're just checking all the boxes, then we're not endeavoring anything. We're not eager to maintain the unity of anything because we're just there to check boxes. So then we can't get to know each other, we can't forbear each other, we can't have patience, we can't have love. So there's an obvious kind of conclusion to that, which is study, study together, worship together, spend time with each other. Mm -hmm. Ron? Just thinking as you were talking, Stephen, over in uh, 2 Peter 3, 16, 17, and 18, but in 16 he talks about those that are unlearned and unstable end up falling into destruction. In verse 17, he says, You therefore, beloved, since you know this beforehand, beware lest you also fall from your own steadfastness, being led away with the error of the wicked, but grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So as we know, this teaches that once saved, always saved isn't truthful. And the way we avoid falling is in growth. And growth is not automatic. You know, right. physical growth is, spiritual growth is. <laughs> right, right, exactly right. And even physical growth, you, you can grow up to a certain point, but if you neglect to nourish your body, you're, you're going to wither and eventually die if there's not enough nourishment there. So, good point. Mike? Well, just like what I plan to say, you know, the real question is, if you just come in here and do that checklist, is it being diligent? Preserve that unity, and I think that he pointed that out well. Right, right, exactly right. So, the emphasis here, as he's talking about being unified and having a healthy body of Christ, a healthy congregation of God's people, that we are to to come together, we are to study, and we are to do our part. Uh, question four asks, what's required of every Christian for their attitude? and actions in light of verse 13. Till we all come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to a perfect man to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. So what's required of us? Hebrews chapter 5 and verse 12, he says, For though by the time you ought to be teachers, you have need that someone teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God. He's telling us, that we must be teachers. You it, ought to be teachers. That's an expectation that has been set before us. Right, exactly. Now, not everybody needs to be a preacher, but we all need to be a teacher. Right. To some degree, in some manner, being able to sit down and talk to people about the gospel and teach them, instruct them in what is written in the Word of God. It's a good point on that. And we're, we're aiming for this unity in the faith that we're, we're studying and so we're all living by the same standard because we have the same convictions because we're studying from the same source and going by that. And when we do that, he says, verse 14, what will that provide us? Well, so it's not be like children, so it provides growth because it's maturity. And you have something as it goes on to talk about every 
way of the wind of doctrine that comes along, you have something that you're grounded, you're rooted in, something that you're not going to be easily moved in. Mm -hmm. So, you know, with that, you know, I also see, you know, by the trickery of men, craftiness, mm -hmm. deceitful scheming. So we're able to identify that scheming, that's trickery, that's craftiness, that's whatever it is. So we're able to identify the falsehood as compared to the truth. Right, exactly right. It gives us a stability in the truth, which is very comforting. It's not necessarily, um, as he says here, the, using those words, endeavoring earlier in the chapter, we, we have to work for this, but there is a stability, and that stability brings a great measure of comfort and peace of mind. I'm living in the truth. We have to know we can understand the truth and we can live in that truth. And we do not need to apologize to anyone who criticizes us or complains. Well, you think you're the only one that's going to heaven. Well, you think you know it all? Well, I, no, I don't think I know it all. But there are things I know and there's nothing you're ever going to say to me that's going to convince me otherwise. I know there's a God. I know it. And I don't care what you say. <laughs> You're not going to convince me there's not a God. I know there's one body. I know there's a Savior. I know there is a defined body of truth. I know that. You are not going to persuade me away from that. And that's not saying I'm, there may be things you could teach me about the Word of God, certain things that, that I could change my mind on, I could change my understanding about. But it's written in here, and I'm convicted on that. And it's not where... Every little thing that comes along, it throws us this way and that way and this way and that way. Where we're steadfast. Any, any thoughts there? I think I saw Clint. We sing a song to our children to, to teach this same concept as the wise man build his house upon the rock. Yep. You know, the, are you sure you want to build there? Yes. Yes, I am. Exactly. John. He's saying that the Role, the roles of all these teachers and preachers is to bring us to a fullness so that we're a full-grown, mature adult. Other words you use are also complete and perfect. And so to, to go along with what you're saying, and it's not that we're going to have a perfect, full knowledge of the Scriptures at any given time, but what it means is, is we can open up the Word of God and we can tell the difference between good and evil and judging circumstances and judging truth or false teachers, but we have, we, we're we being led to a point where, yes, we can open up the Bible and find out how we, how we are to act, but to put it simply, we can tell the difference between good and evil. So we know who's going to heaven and who's not going to heaven. We know how to act and how not to act. We know what to do inside the church and what not to do. It's, but it's, uh, you know, we're, we're perfect in the sense that we can, we can judge a situation based on the Word of God. Yeah, we're whole. And as you said, complete is used in there as well. All right, so he says we need to do this in speaking the truth in love, always keeping in mind we, we have the best interests of others at heart. We're not arguing just to prove that we are right, but we want people to come to a knowledge of the truth that they too may be saved. So question five I had asked, how are we connected to one another and why does this matter? What's required of each of us? So how are we connected? Through Christ. Connected through Christ. All right. Why does that matter? If we're not connected through Christ, then there's no joining of the bodies of individuals through love. Okay, no joining together through love. Look, we, we have a responsibility to Christ in this. It's not just to one another. Yeah, we have a responsibility to each other, but ultimately that responsibility is through Christ. And we will give an account to Him. I'm not going to give an account to any of you on the day of judgment. And you're not going to give an account to me. We give an account to the Lord. And it's our relationship in Him that helps us to appreciate one another. That you are my brother, you are my sister. That the Lord shed his blood for you. And we are in the same family and we need to look out for each other. And help each other to grow and to be built up in the faith. So we are knit together. How? Verse 16. Every 
joint supplies according to the fifty four. Every joint. Okay, but what every joint supplies? Who is the every joint? Well, if one joint doesn't work, the rest of the part of that body will not move. Well, you think of like in terms of um, you know, a couple separate, but they have joint custody of their children. That means both of them have something that unites them together. A joint checking accounts, you know, things like that. Um, two different things but here they become very common and they're unified in this. In the analogy of the body that he's describing here, nutrient travels from one member to another through the joint. So if you separate that, of course, that extremity is going to die. And so where we're joined together is where we, are, we gain the nutrient physically. And it is so the case that he's just describing to us through this chapter of being joined together is how we edify one another spiritually. Yes, being joined together. Uh, John? It might be better that uh, instead of thinking of, about the body, the human body, think about a structure or a building. And, you know, throughout you know, this chapter and also other, other passages, we know that the church is a, is a spiritual building, so to speak, that is, that is fit together and joined together. Well, what joins us together is the Word of God that all these folks are trying to bring us to the fullness of a man of God. So it's the, the truth is binding us together in that spiritual building, which is which is the church. And, and that's the thing that concretes or cements us together. Yes. Nancy. I was just going to say in Colossians 2.19, he talks about that the whole body, um, the head from, from whom all the body is nourished and knit together, and the head is Christ. Right. And in a local congregation, he's pointing to the fact all of us have a duty and a responsibility to supply that body. In other words, we can't be here and be dead weight. We shouldn't be here and be a cancer on the body. We need to be those who are Verse 15, growing up in all things into Him who is the head. In other words, we are constantly working on ourselves to be more like Christ. And as we do that, as we are knit together, we supply, we encourage, we strengthen, we build each other up. That's, that's going to make for a healthy body of Christ. That's not going to be tossed to and fro. That's not going to... You know, somebody comes in, teaches air that we're all just all of a sudden swept away. That we're, we're stable, we're solid. When we face the challenges of the world and, and trying to teach people and we get that opposition, it doesn't break us. We continue on in teaching that word, Mike. Yeah, it's one of the few entities also that exist on earth that fall in verse 16 for the building up of itself. Um, I can't really think of any other entity that, that does that, where it builds itself up. You know, even in a company, there's a supply and demand, you know, it, it depends on some external factor. That's not the way the church works. Um, it is very much a closed system in which it can actually grow in spirit and truth and, and, you know, harmony and unity uh, all of its own. Well, it, and it, it's kind of like this, and this is one of those beauties of how the Bible uses, you know, the body as an illustration for the church, that the body can heal itself. You know, they, scientists cannot crack that code, right? They can't make an artificial body that functions and has all the things that our bodies have. They, they just can't, they're going to make robots, it's going to look, you know, human-like and things, but they're never going to be able to replicate or duplicate a human body. It's just not going to happen. And it heals itself, it, it, it nourishes, it, it finds its own nourishment, it, it, you know, we learn and all those things. And, and so to Mike's point, you know, we, we, as God's people, nourish through Christ 
as revealed through the word of the Holy Spirit, that we can grow. There's, there's no outside things needed. And this is the way we grow. This is the way we, we're healthy. We start taking in outside things, it's going to be unhealthy. J.D.? Yeah, what helps me is uh, coming from the medical field is the, the body, for example, in 15, 16, if you read at it, uh, who is the head, Christ is the head. In the medical speaking, you can live without an arm. You know, Jesus even spoke about that. He said, if your uh, arm offends you, your hand offends you, you could cut it off. But if you severe the head, that's what controls your movements, that's what you control everything. So if you think about it, if we're joined together, being the head being Christ, if we don't have Christ at the head, the body is almost like severe. It would be useless. It would be dead. Right, totally useless without Christ. All right, we're going to have to wrap it up there. Next week, Lord willing, we'll quickly pick up at 17, and we're going to go like lightning right into chapter 5. But good discussion today. Thank you all.